Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your wonderful word, and we pray that your spirit inside of us will help us to understand it and make it clear. Uh, We do pray that this message will go forth in boldness, and we pray that we will draw closer to you and that you will help us to learn uh, these wonderful truths in our lives. So bless this time, and we look to you, uh, the almighty God who works in each one of us. Thank you, Lord, for... Uh, choosing us. Thank you for bringing us to the place in our life where we trusted you as our Savior. So do your work in our hearts, we pray in the name of Jesus, your Son, that your perfect will be done. Amen. So this morning we're uh, in Romans chapter 8, looking at verses 15 through 17, talking about us being sons of God, God's sons, uh, God's sons who have all the rights and privileges of an heir of God and how all this is accomplished through everything that he has done for us. So uh, just to read these verses real quick and then we'll go through them. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And of children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we might also be glorified with him. We've been made children of God. Uh, The difference between Uh, they're basically saying the same thing. We've been adopted into God's family. But to be a son of God is uh, the idea that we're heirs of him. All the, um, the things that came to the son, the oldest son of a family, he had more privileges than the others did. Well, God has said to all of us, everybody in his church, that all of these privileges I've given to you as being a child of God. It's a remarkable thing that we can be children of God because at one time we were children of wrath, of his wrath, because of our sin. That's Ephesians chapter 2. So I'm just going to lo- read a few verses from 1 John chapter 3. Say what an amazing thing it is that we can be called children of God. And it's because of his love for us in his grace that he's given to us, in his mercy that he shows to us. So John writes, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. I think God wants us to know this. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure, as God is pure. So, He wants us to know right now, from the moment we're saved, we are a child of God. We're placed by the Holy Spirit through adoption into his family. That's a fact. And that's something that sometimes I really need to know. Because when we sin, and we do, we all do, that our conscience will really go after us, and it should. The devil will really go after us and accuse us and tell us that we're worthless and we might as well give up, and maybe we're not saved at all. Yeah, probably we're not even saved at all, acting like this or doing what I just did. He just pounces on us. He's like a roaring lion. He wants to devour and destroy. And he uses sin to do that. He tempts us, and when we give in to it, then he pounces and fills us full of guilt, and you're really not a child of God. So what God wants us to know is, yes, we are children of God. 
We belong to him. We're in his family. And it's all his doing, what he's done for us. We can't do this ourselves. So in this section right here, in, in verse 15, it says, for you did not receive. So we, we have to wonder what this for is for. And we'll go back to verse 14. And it said, all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery. So he's going to present uh, three reasons why we know that we are the sons of God. In verse uh, 15, 16, and 17. So the first one in verse 15 is, we, are, we know we're sons of God because we are adopted. It's something he did for us. I was adopted before I was born. I adopted two more kids a few years ago. When you do it, it's done. You're adopted as something that happened. I'm still adopted. I'm adopted twice, once by God, once by my mom and dad. And then we're sons of God because he tells us we are inside. He really does. And then we're sons of God because we're heirs of his. I've been heirs twice, once for my father who died many years ago and my mother that died uh, many years after he did and uh, several years ago. And you receive an inheritance. Uh, the sad part is your parents die. <laughs> and that's, um, I still have things happen in my life. I want to call up my mom and say, Mom, boy, you won't believe what just happened, but you can't. Uh, she's not here. I trust she, that she's with the Lord. But we receive an inheritance. And uh, usually nowadays that, that means money. And, and I did find, my dad did say, uh, an inheritance you receive from me. He said, it'll seem like a lot, but I'm telling you, you it'll be gone before you know it. <laughs> you know, and the truth was, I, I could have gone out and, and bought a car for that amount of money. It would have been a really fancy car but there were cars that I couldn't buy with that amount of money. And uh, there was enough to buy a car. And that was a, a great thing. You could walk into a showroom, look at a car and say, I want that one. And they say, well, let's talk about financing. And I say, I don't have to. I I'm an heir. Look what I have. Look what my parents have given to me. I have all this because, of, because my dad died. And God is saying to us, you're an heir. Look at all this. A car, anything on this world is nothing compared to what he gives us and what we have from him and being heirs. It's just amazing that God loves us so much that he has taken such good care of us and, and that he's made us heirs because he's adopted us. And what we're going to see in the future we're going to go, I never could have described it. I never knew it was going to be this good. And the thing is, it will never run out. It will never go away. It's reserved in heaven for us forever and ever. Oh, how much God loves us. I want to keep remembering that, how much he loves me to give me all of this. So uh, first of all, we're God's sons because we are adopted. And it says we didn't receive a spirit of slavery no, we received the Holy Spirit. Uh, he already talked about being enslaved to sin in Romans 6.6. 6. He says, when we're unsaved, we are slaves of sin. It's very hard to stop sinning. He that sins is a slave of sin. But we have not received that when we got saved. Oh, something's different. It's much different. Uh, it says in Galatians 4.8 that, before we're saved, we are slaves of gods or idols, false gods that are not even real. Well, we've been delivered from that. Now we have the true living God, the, the one that actually made everything, the only God. God says, I don't know of any other God because there isn't any other. Uh, it says in Titus 3.3, 3, we've been delivered from various passions and pleasures that we used to be enslaved to. Our passions, our pleasures. There was a time in most of my life, I think, that the most important thing in life was to have pleasure, to have happiness. 
And I always looked for that. I thought that's the purpose of life. But uh, what I found was I was just enslaved to passions and pleasures and sins that were wrong. And then it says in Hebrews 2.15 that we're slaves of the fear of death. Death is hanging over every person that has ever been born. And um, if people say they're not afraid of death. Well, they, they really are when it comes to the time, comes down to it. Uh, one time I heard a um, man tell a story uh, about being on an airplane. And he was sitting next to a man with an incredible watch. And he said to that man, that's an amazing watch because this man was a Christian and he wanted to talk to him about the Lord. And, and this man said, ah, this, this watch is nothing. And he said, well, aren't you afraid that somebody's going to steal that and try to beat you up and take it? And he said, I'm not afraid of anything. And he said, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, I'm not afraid of anything. And then he told this man that he worked for uh, an international world bank that delivers money to third world countries as loans with interest rates that they will never be able to repay. And that's how they control these companies, these countries, whole countries. This happened back in the uh, 70s, late 70s, or early 80s. This has been going on a long time. And after a while, this man says, you know, I, I really need to be honest with you. He says, I'm afraid of one thing. I am afraid of one thing, and that's dying. I don't know what's going to happen to me. Right now, I am incredibly protected. When this man that told me the story, when he got off the plane, he waited there for the guy to get off. He wanted to talk to him more, and the guy never got off. The plane flew away, and he wonders, how did the guy get off that plane? He said, the guy said, I am very well taken care of. I'm very protected in this world but I'm afraid of dying. I'm afraid of death. What happens after that? Uh, we say, well, well you're reincarnated. You know, I want to come back as this or that. Or we say, well, you just go to sleep. You need, it's like, like there's no more consciousness. But the Bible does teach something different. It teaches a conscious death forever and ever in either of two places, heaven or hell. We have been enslaved by the fear of dying. Not anymore because Jesus rose from the dead, because I am his child, I too will rise from the dead. As Soon as I'm dead, my body falls, however, whenever that would happen, I'll immediately go to be with him, my spirit, my consciousness. And then eventually it will be reunited to a body that's risen from the dead. That's something not to be afraid of anymore, something I'm not a slave to anymore. So he says, when you got saved, you didn't receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But here's what you did receive. You received a spirit of adoption as sons. You see, when we were saved, there was an adoption ceremony that took place. We, we went through... Um, I didn't go through that because I was adopted uh, before I was born. And I was taken out of the hospital at, when I was three days old. And the only parents I've ever known are the ones that adopted me. And whenever I would ask my mom, uh, tell me something about my adopted family. She would say, w why are you, why do you want to know about them? I'm your mother. So I learned pretty quick in life not to ask her that anymore. <laughs> it hurt her. She was my mom. She took me on as her son. My mom and dad both wanted me. They both chose me. But there was no ceremony that I knew of because I was uh, just born. But I had a ceremony with my two kids. And uh, we went through the whole process of all of the the psych tests and the social tests and the finance test and all the background checks and got to do it again and got to do your fingerprints again and run your picture everywhere and all the FBI and everybody that checks on you and all the stuff we had to go through and the medical tests and the medical examination. And finally, one day, we got to go to the courthouse here and um, with our two kids. And after all the pronouncements were made and they were officially ours, then... We got to go 
up in front of the court, and the judge came down, and we all stood there with the judge and, and the two women, that, um, the lawyer and the women from social services that helped us through the whole process. And we had a ceremony, and the kids were officially ours, and we have the pictures in a frame to prove it all. We have the papers to prove it all. It's something that happened. It was done. It was a glorious, wonderful day. And it still was, no matter how bad they act. <laughs> it still is a wonderful, glorious day because they always don't act bad. Sometimes they're just as cute as fun as can be, most of the time. Yeah. So I guess we're that way with God. <laughs> I don't think he ever looks at us and saying, oh, I made a bad choice. <laughs> that was wrong. He knows our hearts. He knows who we are. He said, I loved you and I adopted you. The ceremony is done. You're in my family and it will never change. It will never change. And the, the children are my heir. I have to leave them something. I have to. That's, that's the law. They're my adopted kids. I cannot unadopt them. I'm glad that my parents adopted me. It, it was a very rocky road through my teenage years, but... I'm still glad. It was God's plan all the way along. So he says, I have adopted you and I put you into my family. It was the Holy Spirit that did this. How wonderful is that? We have received the Spirit of God, the Spirit of adoption. We received it. That's how everything from God comes to us. Everything he does for us comes to us when we receive him. It's not our doing. It's what he has already all done. In John 1.12, as many as received Christ, who believed in his name, and that's how you get saved. You believe in his name as the savior of the world, who satisfied God the Father with his atonement, his death on the cross. He gave the right to become the children of God. We become Children of God, we have the right to because we receive our Savior. There are people today, Christians, that say, oh, that's, we don't receive Christ. You know, you got to, he has to be Lord of your life and you got to do this and this and you got a lot of things you got to do to show you're worthy or something. I don't know. No, to as many as receive him, he gives the right to become children of God. We're adopted. And then 1 Corinthians 2.12 now we have received not the spirit of the world. We don't want that one anymore. But we have received the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. God says uh, many times, especially in the Old Testament, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts as the heavens are higher than the earth. How, how much higher is the heavens than the earth? Well, it goes on for billions and billions of light years. Light traveling 186,000 miles in one second. Billions and billions of those. God says, my thoughts are way up here and your thoughts are down here. So what I need to do, I need to put my spirit in you that is me. And then when you read his word and when you look at life, when you understand everything I'm saying, my spirit will make known to your spirit what I'm talking about. <laughs> You'll understand it. It'll be clear to you. And God does that for us. We've been adopted as sons. Adoption is officially, in this Bible, a declaration of something that God has done to bring us into his family as children and sons. Um, uh, the Greek lexicon says its adoption is uh, of those who believe in Christ and are accepted by God as his God's children with full rights we have. That's the sonship of it all. So uh, some new translations will, if it says uh, a son, they'll want to say, well, sons and daughters. But in this point here, it's not right to say sons and daughters. It's right to say all the women are sons because in the church, there's no female, there's no male, there's no slave, there's no free, there's no Jew, there's no Gentile. We're all one in Christ and we're all sons of God, heirs of God. And because of that, we could cry out to him, cry out to him and say, Abba, Father, that's like saying, Daddy, Daddy, I need help. 
And there's times in my life I do need help. There's times in my life when I call out to him. And I'll say, please, save me. <laughs> I need help right now. A lot of times I find in my life that um, things in other people's lives or my own life seem so bad, it just seems hopeless. And it seems like, oh, it will just never change. Or, uh, or I don't know the answer. I just don't know it at all. And, and in my mind, I'm just all perplexed and starting to get so worried and so afraid. And, and God says, it's time to call Daddy, Daddy. Daddy, help me. I don't know what to do. And, and I'm serious. Within minutes, uh, so a lot of times I'll know what to do. And I'll think, why didn't I call sooner? But that's what he's saying to us. You have a new dad in heaven. And you can call on him when you need him. You can talk to him all the time whether you need him or not. It's really good too. Why did he do that for us? <laughs> It's amazing to look at it, and, and I guess um, I guess uh, he he chose us because he wanted to. He adopted us because he wanted to. That's the way he is. In uh, Galatians chapter four, it, it talks about the exact same things that is in Romans chapter eight. In Galatians chapter four, uh, beginning with verse four, it says. When the fullness of time had come, see, God has a plan throughout the ages. And when it's time for something, he does it. He accomplishes it. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive adoption as sons. It's because of Christ coming into the world. The perfect lamb of God, never sinned once, died for our sins. Because God sent him to die for our sins into the world so that we can be, receive adoption as sons. He did that so we can be adopted. That's what it took. And because you are sons, God has sent his spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Daddy, Daddy. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And of a son, then an heir through God. And if, and if we want to look at it a little farther to understand more why he did this, he, he talks about it in the book of Ephesians in the first chapter. Uh, beginning in verse 3, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ, it's always in Christ, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. See, before the foundation of the world, it's not that God looked down through time and said, okay, he receives me, he doesn't. So he I chose because I know he's going to receive me, and he I chose because I know he won't receive me. He didn't. It's not that. It's that he looked down through time Everything that happens in the world, he makes happen. He has plans. He carries them out. It, it's, it, I guess from my viewpoint, it's hard to understand. But he is saying here that before the foundation of the world, before the planet was here, the stars, or nothing was here but him and his glory and all of his brilliance and light, he, he planned the whole ages all the way along. There, there's times that are, that are prophecy, they're still to come. And God says, I'm going to put thoughts in his heart to make him attack Israel. God is going to do that. He does that. He accomplishes his will. And he says, before the foundation of the world, he wanted me to be adopted. And, and I came to the point in my life where I say, I receive you as my Savior. I didn't even know at that point there was even adoption. I didn't, all I knew was that I was a sinner and he was the Savior, and I wanted him to save me. Uh, it says in verse 5, He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons. And that's exactly what we're reading about. He did it through Jesus Christ. And why did he do it? 
It was all according to the purpose of his will. He chose me because he purposed it and he willed it. It's what he wanted to do. And it has nothing to do with me. It's all to do with him. And forever I look to him and all I can say is thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> because I don't deserve it. And I cannot earn it. Because, in verse 6, he adopted us through Christ to the praise of his glorious grace. To the praise of grace. Remember, grace is giving us something we cannot earn and we do not deserve. To the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us with, in the beloved. And here's how we can be adopted, because in Christ, in him, we have redemption through his blood. That's why it's a very good day to do communion, to remember his blood shed for us. And that song we sang, well, where, where would I be without the blood? One of the little verses there says, I remember when we take communion, it says to do this in remembrance of him. Remember what he did for you. That's what it's referring to in that song. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, all of them. It is all according to the riches of his grace. There's the grace again. And this grace, I am such a bad sinner. I have been such a bad sinner. He had to lavish his grace upon us. Just pour it out and keep pouring it. <clears throat> so, uh, my adopted mother, one time I took her car and I went to a, a drug house and I spent the night taking drugs in that drug house. And I had to get the car back home so my mother could go to work. And as I was backing the car out, the whole car went boom. And the car wouldn't go. So I got out to look. And there was railroad tracks. And the, they were down a couple of feet. And there was just a sharp cliff. And the back tires went over there. And the car was laying on the ground with the back tires in the air. So I got a ride home with somebody else. And I went to bed. And my mother came frantically waking me up to say, where's the car? And all I could say was it's on the tracks and the train's coming. <laughs> so my mother adopted me and that's, how, that's who she had to deal with, a jerk such as I. And, and uh, somehow I got out to where uh, this location was and she somehow went there and got a tour. I never did know how she got the car out of there. And she didn't hate me. But she didn't like me. <laughs> How? I look back on that. I think, what a dirty rat. Rats are better than I was. How mean. How cruel. How inconsiderate. A, a dope taken jerk. And God says, you all are. And it's only because I'm giving you what you don't deserve. I've given you the world. More than this world, I'm making you my heirs, the very God that made every star in the universe, trillions of them. I'm all powerful, and I can give you stuff that you can't imagine. It's going to be so good for you, and I'm doing it because you don't deserve it and you can't earn it. I love you. I am good to you. And we need to remember that when we're condemned or when we start to doubt our salvation. We need to remember what God has given us. We need to remember what John said, you are sons of God, and you are. You are sons of God, now you are. <laughs> he has to keep you telling this out because we got to keep remembering that. He doesn't want us to sin, and all that is so we will live a righteous, holy life. He wants us to, and he gives us the power to. So why did God do this? 
because he wanted to, and he's gracious and he's loving and he's kind. And we're part of his plan throughout the ages. Every single believer has a place in God's plan. We all do. And we can cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, Daddy, I love you so. So uh, he tells us that we're his sons because we're adopted. And then he tells us we're his sons because he tells us that. <laughs> um, how clear is that? Well, verse 16, the spirit himself. Not any other spirit is the spirit himself. He bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. He lets us know inside that we're the children of God. And it seems that at the very hardest times in my life, or the times when I've sinned, or the times that I have any kind of a doubt, I can go to him and I can say, would you please help me understand? And I'm serious, within a few minutes, I'm saying thank you for helping me to understand, to look at the facts, because when turmoil comes into our life, from whatever it is, our family, our jobs, our money, our health, our, our sin, uh, anything, something else happens. Uh, today, there's enough stuff in the news to make us nervous wrecks all the time. When, when you see what this new world, or, world order wants to do, they want to take away our prime rib and give us crickets. Now they're saying, oh, the cow's got bird flu in them. I say, you're a bunch of bird brains. And I'm not sorry to say that because they are. They're fools. They're acting stupid. They're, they're trying to take away our food supply. I look at all this, and you can get so worried about it all. And you can say, God, would you please help me to feel a little more secure here? <laughs> Give me a little more hope. And it says, his spirit bears witness with our spirit. And this word bears witness, it's the word for witness, which is the word for martyr. A martyr is a witness, and then they die for their witness for Christ. Well, we're, he's bearing witness, and there's a little prefix on the front that means together. Together he's bearing witness. He is so together, the Spirit of God, with our spirit inside of us, that he is communicating to us, telling us our spirit to let us know for sure, yes, you do belong to God. Yes, you are in his hand. Yes, you are his adopted son. Yes, the ceremony really did take place the day you were saved. It really happened. You really belong to him. When I go to Sacramento and uh, the chiropractor I go to is in somewhat of the same neighborhood that I grew up in, and I can go down the road and I can say, I remember the stuff I did in this house. I can remember sneaking over that girl's house in the middle of the night and tapping on a window and getting her out. I can remember uh, stealing a car here. I can remember getting in a fight here. I can remember, oh, there's the school I never went to because I committed truancy so much. I, I can just, everything bad I've ever done, and, and within minutes I can think, why would I ever think I'm saved? <laughs> Look at the kind of person I am. Well, God, would you please help me to see that I'm saved, that you saved me. You washed all my sins away. All this stuff, why am I remembering it? You don't remember it anymore. You've forgotten all of my sins. The Bible says so. You buried them in the deepest sea. That's really deep. As far as the east from the west, they never joined. You separated me from my sins. You've washed me. You cleansed me. You did a lot of scrubbing, and you still have to scrub a lot on me. Help me to know in my spirit that I belong to you. And he does. The spirit inside of us says, you are saved. You belong to your father. I'm the spirit in you. And that's something that you can only know when the spirit of God is in you. He comes in at salvation at every single person. And I'm thankful. And then at verse 17, we know we're sons of God because we are his heirs. And, and we're one, an heir is somebody that receives something as a possession. We're a beneficiary. And here it's talking about believers being beneficiaries of what God has given to us. And he, and he has given uh, much more than we know. And when we get there, then we'll realize it. Um, in Titus 
chapter 3 is talking about uh, what he's given to us, his heirs. Verse 4, but when the goodness and loving kindness of our God and Savior appeared, and that's what it takes, the goodness and the loving kindness, because if you look right above that, it says that at one time in our life, We were foolish and disobedient. We were led astray. We were slaves to various passions and pleasures and living our lives in malice. And oh my goodness, what a mess. But when the goodness of God and the loving kindness of God, our Savior appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of our works done by us in righteousness, but according to him, his own mercy. See what we're talking about today? It wasn't David and his power that slew the giant. It was God. And it wasn't us adopting, putting ourselves into adoption. He adopted us. And it's his own mercy towards us. By the washing of regeneration. See, when we're saved, the Holy Spirit comes in and actually washes our hearts. The renewal of the Holy Spirit inside of us. He makes us and to a new person, a new creation created in the image of God. And this Holy Spirit, he poured out on us richly, and it's all because Christ forgave our sins through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that we're justified by his grace. We didn't earn it. He's given it to us. That we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. All that, so he wants us to have all that he wants to give us. An heir of God himself. If he made this whole place in six days with, with all these amazing things that, um, th- that we see and say, how beautiful is that? Just a sunset and we look at the clouds. There's that song that we sing, um, and I used to sing it all the time. And I I sang it this week when I go for my walk. I just start singing this song. And it's, um, uh, he made, uh, the mountains are his, the valleys are his, the stars are his handiwork too. And I always throw in real quick. And the clouds too. (laughs) Because when you look at the clouds, you look at these clouds and you think, wow, look at that looks like that and that looks like that and that cloud looks like that. They're just amazing. All the things that God has made. He did all this in six days. 2,000 years ago, he said, I'm going to heaven to make a place for you to live. What kind of place could he make for me to live in thousands of years? <laughs> he did this in six days. Wow. That's all the way he can describe it. There's a lot of gold there. <laughs> and the gold's so pure, you can see through it. It's transparent. And everything is made out of all these different precious stones. Just incredible what God is doing for us. He he washed us, he cleansed us so we can be his heirs. He really wants us to grab a handle on these things. And his heirs we are. We're fellow heirs with Christ, too. We're going to always be with him. Uh, in the wonderful book of Thessalonians, it, it talks about a time that's going to come. And maybe the time is pretty soon. I don't know. I would like it to be. I think it should be. God has his own timetable. And it's never mine. Uh, but it says in First Thessalonians chapter 4, we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, those who have already died that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and Jesus rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So all the believers that have fallen asleep in his church, that have already died, he's going to bring them back one time in the air. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, and there will be Christians here who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, that we won't perceive those who have already fallen asleep because the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with a shout of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, we're going to be caught up in just a split second together to meet with them in the clouds, in the air, to meet the Lord in the air 
And so we will always be with the Lord. And so we will always be with the Lord. We're heirs with him. And at some day, we'll always be with him. With God himself, who made us, who forgave us and loved us, who, who just says, let there be light, who just says, let there be all the animals in the world, and all at once they all appear. Who said, let all the earth be full of all the trees, and all at once they all appear. Let all the stars come in all billions and billions. The Bible says, this is how big God is. It says the stars are the work of his fingers. He just took his fingers and he put them all out there. And he says, not one of them is missing. In case you ever look up there, I guess we can see about 3,500 stars with our bare eyes. Then you look through a telescope and you put a telescope in space like the Hubble and man, you can see galaxies. You thought it used to be a star. Now you find out it's a galaxy with a trillion stars in it. He said, not one is missing. And I got a name for every one. If you want to know the name of a star, just ask me and I'll tell you. I'll remember them all. I don't remember what I had for lunch a few days ago. He remembers stars that he made 6,000 years ago. He made them all in a moment. This kind of a God, we're going to be with him all the time. We'll never not be with him. So we will be with the Lord forever. In John 14, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. And if it weren't so, I would have told you that. And I go in to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. So he is going to take us to his father's house. And we are going to be with him forever and ever and ever. We're heirs of his. And he has so much to give us. This is... Um, a story I think is just really amazing. It's in Revelation chapter 19. And as heirs of God, one of the things he's going to let us do is he's going to let us come back with him at the battle of Armageddon to fight this evil ruler, the Antichrist, and his, his partner, the false prophet, and all the evil armies of the world that come against Jerusalem to try to kill the Jewish people and wipe that city out and all the people in it and try to conquer Jesus Christ. In that battle, he's going to let us come back with him. We're with him. We're heirs of him. We're joint heirs together. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, I saw heaven opened. And, and at that time, we will be in heaven. And John could see, and the people of earth will see heaven opened. And it's happened several times in scripture. It's going to open up. And we'll be able to look into it. And out of it comes a white horse. And the one sitting on it is called faithful and true. In righteousness, he judges and he makes war. Finally, somebody that's coming that judges righteously, not corrupt, bribed judges like we have today. There's good ones, and thank God for them. But the corrupt ones, oh. Well, he's coming as a righteous judge. What do his eyes look like? They're like a flame of fire. What's on his head? Many diadems. And a name is written that no one knows himself. And he's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. The blood he shed for us. And his name was called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, they are arrayed in fine linen, white and pure. Uh, who are they? Well, if you look back earlier in the chapter at the marriage of the Lamb, the, the people that are getting married are clothed in fine linen, bright and pure. In verse 8, we're the bride that marries the Lamb, marries the bridegroom, Christ himself. And we're coming back with him out of heaven on a horse, a white horse. I ridden a horse one time in my life, and it didn't have a saddle, and it was a hundred and something. And I got all sweaty as soon as I got on it because he was all sweaty. This is going to be better than that. White horses coming down with him, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword. You can imagine 
when Christ comes back at the Battle of Armageddon, defeat the evil armies of the world, the evil that we see taken over now, that he says, you're my partners in this. You're my fellow heirs. You're coming with me. Huh. And in verse 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of King and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun with a loud voice calling to all the birds that fly directly overhead, come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of the mighty men and the flesh of horses and the riders and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, that's the Antichrist, and their armies all gathered together, the one world government, to gather together to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. He's going to come to do battle against us and against our God, Jesus Christ, Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who was in the presence, had done many signs which he used to deceive those who received the mark of the beast and those who worship at his image. And these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And all the birds are gorged with their flesh. That's one thing that we're going to get to do. Be there. We'll be there and we'll see it. We'll be part of it. We're heirs of God. We're his sons. And he made us that way because he loves us so much. Thank you, God. Regarding this whole uh, section in, in Romans chapter 8, um, in this commentary by Chuck Swindoll, he, he has commentaries on uh, most or all of the books of the New Testament. This is the one on Romans. And regarding this section, where it starts out in Romans 8, one where it says no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus and then it starts talking about the Holy Spirit everything the Holy Spirit's doing for us and in us and and God saying I have made you sons I have made you clean I have made you so there's no more condemnation I have made you heirs I have made you this and I have made you that and you need to get the idea that it's all me and it's not you if we live according to the flesh we will die if we live according to the spirit we will live it's all about what God has done for us. He sums this up. And, and it's entitled permission to do nothing. So follow along. Uh, Paul took great pains to convince believers that only unbelieving people exist according to the flesh. All the people that live according to the flesh were all unbelievers. That only the sons of God exist that have the spirit of God. So if you're an unbeliever, you have according to the flesh. If you're a son of God, then you have the spirit of God in you and that's according to the spirit. So the natural reaction to the truth uh, would be to say, then I want to live by the spirit. How do I do that? I will admit my first inclination was to comb the passage for applications. You see, when you look through this, through this passage and you look through it in Greek and you can see it in English, there's, there's, no, there's no imperatives. There's no commands. There's no do this. There's no do that. All there is is, here's who you are. He said he wanted to find that because he's a preacher and he wants to say, this is what God says to do. But I found no imperatives, no commands, no shoulds or no should nots, not even a helpful suggestion. The apostle didn't describe what kind of behavior will help us exist according to the spirit or prescribe a seven-step plan to becoming more spiritual. To be quite honest, Chuck Swindoll says, I found that frustrating. I confess that in my flesh, I tried to turn this spirit-led life into a self-made life of holiness, self-made holiness. Suddenly, I found myself back in chapter 7, 
Remember chapter 7 in Romans? The very thing I hate doing, I keep doing it. The very thing I know is the right thing to do, I can't do it. Who will deliver me from the body of this death? Thank God through Jesus Christ. Well, when he's trying to make himself do things to make himself spiritual, then I reminded, I was reminded that the flesh is ever with us. The sinful nature, remember, it doesn't go away. And, and it wants to be in control. It always does. Instead of citing a list of deeds that result in holiness, Paul assured us that the Spirit of God decided on his own to start living in us and through us and through us the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit of the flesh. It's the fruit of the Spirit. He wants to live his spiritualness in us. Then he described what the Spirit will do for us and all the blessings we will receive as a result. He has an exclamation point there. Existing in the Spirit is not about what we do for him. Remember, we can do nothing. Remember, Jesus said, too, without me, you, can, you cannot do anything. The Spirit, the Spirit life is about what he will do on our behalf because the indwelling presence of God's Spirit is a gift of grace. Don't deserve it, can't earn it. The same gift that redeems us from slavery to sin and rescues us from it. That's the spirit we have. The free gift of salvation from sin begins now, not just after the grave. The new life we have, the new spirit we have of God, the new nature that knows the right thing to do, we have it right now. We don't have to wait to die. When you do die, the old one's gone. Still there now. So what must we do? What is our obligation? It's not that complicated. Difficult to do because the flesh will not surrender control easily. But the answer uh, to what is our obligation? What, what do we have to do? Uh, the answer is nothing. So now understand what I'm saying. These are all good things. And we should be doing them, most of them. Nothing. He has a question mark. Nothing. What? You don't have to pray? You don't have to get up at 4 a.m. for a quiet time? You don't have to have family devotions? You don't have to give away all your money? Or you don't have to take a shower every day? Or obey the Ten Commandments? Or wear dark clothing? Or eat low-fat foods? Or do a pile of good deeds to become more spiritual? What? No. Nothing. If you have the Spirit within you, you're as spiritual as you're ever going to be because the Spirit is as spiritual as he ever is. And he wants to live his life betraying his fruit through us. If there is an imperative to be found in Paul's description of the Spirit life, it is to quit trying so hard to be spiritual because we just get discouraged because we can't do it in ourselves. Without me, you can do nothing. He says, stop all of that. Instead, let the spirit be spiritual in us. When that makes sense to you, you can be sure you're setting your mind on the things of the spirit and you're starting to understand grace. Until then, you won't be ready to understand the rest of what's in the book of Romans. It's, it's that important. And it's something that we learn his spirit inside of us teaches us and helps us understand. We go through so many defeats in life trying to do the right thing and not doing it. When I look at my, my two birth kids and I see good things in them, well, thank God. And then I see bad things in them that are really annoying. And the thing is, they're just like me. I remember the first time I saw that in my son, I thought, that is really annoying. And I thought, he's acting just like I do. Because he grew up with me. I gave him the pattern to follow. He follows what I do. <laughs> ah, you get, we get so frustrated. Let the Spirit of God be the Spirit of God in us to do what he wants to, us to do. And he wants us to know that we belong to him, that we're his sons, that we have been adopted. It's a sure done deal. It could be no more clear, no more set in stone, better than stone. It's set in heaven and with God in his eyes. 
His Spirit's in us, and we belong to Him, and His Spirit says, let me live. Let me do my thing. And you just stay back out of the way because you're going to mess it up. And that's something we learn. And we get better at it all through our Christian life if we're growing. Remember what Peter said, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We learn more about Christ, all about how he works and what he did for us and the spirit in us. And we grow in the grace. We understand more and more, the more we realize what sinners we are, the more we realize how much grace God has to, to love us anyway, <laughs> to still love us. So that's that. He said it's not very complicated. Sounds complicated to me, but it's not. Let the spirit be spirit and leave it at that. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for these wonderful truths. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for showing us mercy and thank you for your marvelous grace that forgives us from everything that Christ did on the cross, that perfect Lamb of God, thank you for dying for us and saving our souls. And as we have a time now remembering why all this is possible because of your shed blood and your broken body given for us, uh, just uh, really bless our hearts, Lord. Really bless us in this time so good and that we'll love you more and more today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And we pray that your perfect will will be done in everything. Amen.